Hello, and welcome to the Twilight Pwn, the internet's third most popular Twilight Zone podcast. My name is Fred, and I am joined tonight by my co-host, Nobody, because I kicked John to the curb temporarily uh, to do a special edition of the podcast. About a year ago, I discovered a book online called A Dimension of Sound about music in the Twilight Zone. I wrote the publisher, a company called Pendragon Press, uh, and they were kind enough to let me pretend to be a member of the media, and they sent me a press copy of the book. Um, I read it and and really enjoyed it. It's very detailed. It's got biographies of all the composers. It's got anecdotes about the makings of all the scores, totally unique trivia, and also really smart analysis. It's it's one of those books that can kind of be enjoyed on an academic level and also sort of on a pure TZ geek level. So both halves of me were very satisfied. It's written by a professor named Reba Wisner. Uh, She has an MFA and PhD in musicology from Brandeis, uh, and currently she lectures at Berklee College and the John J. Kelly School of Music at Montclair State University. But on top of that, she was nice enough to spend an afternoon talking about her book with me. Um, So what you're about to hear is the interview along with uh, plenty of clips from the show. We cover a lot of ground, everything from the origins of the theme song to the one missing Twilight Zone score to some of the hidden meanings behind classic cues that you'll probably recognize. Uh, It was really fun to talk about it with her and nerd out. Uh, We talked for probably more than an hour, but I think I cut it down to a slightly more reasonable length. Uh, Reba knows everything about music in the Twilight Zone. I urge you to uh, listen to the interview and then post haste, get thee to the internet to buy a copy of the book because it's a must have for a true TZ fan. Anyway, to the interview. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, how did you first get uh, interested in the Twilight Zone? So it's actually all my parents' fault. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And actually, in my book, and the dedication is to my parents who turned on the Twilight Zone and unknowingly created a monster. Um, And your dad's right here right now. Yes, he is. He's just sitting and watching. (laughs) He's got a smug little smile on his face. (laughs) It's all his fault, and he knows it. Uh, (laughs) So they, when CBS actually used to run the Twilight Zone, um, right. before sci-fi picked it up. My parents would turn it on when there was something good on TV, um, and they didn't quite realize what they were doing to me. <laughs> so uh, I think I saw my first Twilight Zone episode when I was about six. Oh, wow, okay. uh, The first one I actually remember seeing was Five Characters in Search of an Exit. That's a creepy one at six. <laughs> it, it, yeah, especially <laughs> considering, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the first one I remember seeing, and probably it's because it was so creepy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I never miss a marathon, and things like that and then when I was writing my dissertation which oddly enough is on 17th century Venetian opera um, I sort of need to take a break from looking at old dead Venetian people uh, and look at something else I still feel like I was being productive so um, I said well let me take a look at the Twilight Zone I've actually never really listened to the music before so carefully and that's when I realized it was so much that nobody has covered and just so much good stuff out there and the nice thing about being, being a musicologist is you can sort of go through the archives and see Mm -hmm. composers papers and letters and things like that um and fred steiner for example is one of those people who left behind a lot of stuff yeah he's a composer for the twilight zone (laughs) not everyone knows that (laughs) uh and he uh also did some video interviews he did some really cool stuff like one of the episodes i'm going to talk about today miniature uh he bases the entire thing on a mozart sonata and he also composes it uh at least the dollhouse scenes anyway, as if it were a silent film uh, because of the context. So right, all yeah. those really cool things, the little nuances. Rene Garagwenk, um, who wrote uh, a lot of stock music, but he also did the score for Night of the Meek. Mm-hmm. Uh, the entire thing is a set of variations on the first Noel. Right, yeah. yeah. We noticed that when we were uh, watching it, uh, that it was like, we're like, that sounds Christmassy in a way that's hard to put our finger on, but that's yeah. cool to hear. That's neat. One of the things I was also struck by when reading your book was just just realizing that um, for so many dramas and sitcoms of the era, the characters are experiencing like the same emotional situations again and again, like love or hate or drama. Mm-hmm. But the Twilight Zone, like the sort of emotional palette of it, is very distinct and unique. Like, no, absolutely, and it also is a product of the composers that they were using. Yeah. Um, so Bernard Herrmann too, when he was writing Walking Distance, yeah. uh, and there was a whole controversy with that because he wrote a score and Rod Serling didn't like it. Right. And he told Buck Houghton, do me a favor, get these scenes replaced. And because Bernard Herrmann had such a tempestuous personality, they had two options. They could either have him write new music for those scenes, which would have been a lot of money because they would have had to pay him to write it and then pay him to orchestrate it and then pay an orchestra to re-record everything and then have it dubbed, or they can use stock music, which they knew would have really got him angry. Right. So 
Herman tried to write music that he thought was emotionally suggestive of the characters, which it turned out Ser- Serling didn't really like until he did the new version, right? Yeah. Um, which they wound up eating the cost and doing it. Yeah. Uh, and then Rod Serling actually wrote a really nice note to him telling him it was like the most emotionally poignant scores he's ever heard. Yeah, I, I think there's something in the Martin Graham's book about how like Serling asked for a, sp- a specific recording of it so mm-hmm. he could right. listen to it. I don't, I don't know when yeah. he was listening to it, but right. like smoking cigarette 200 of the day or whatever. Right, pretty much. Drinking yeah. 1,200 cups of coffee. Yeah. So uh, just to rewind a little bit there, in 1957, there was a strike that you write about in your book, um, and it was the Musicians Union mm-hmm. striking, yep. and it, was, it wasn't against specifically CBS, it was against like all broadcasters, or, or what, was, what was the nature of the strike? Well, there was a lot of issues with the music union. Um, the person who was running it at the time was kind of like a dictator, almost. <laughs> it was James Caesar Petrillo, who uh, they called him Caesar Partially okay. because he was... Mm. Uh, yeah. there, there was a pension fund that had to be paid into any time musicians were recording. Yeah. There was also a mandate that you had to pay orchestras a certain amount of money per minute. Right. Uh, and it was so exorbitantly expensive that um, a lot of people were going overseas right. to do it. Right, yeah, I read um, that. Yeah, it was like something $120 versus $40. Right, exactly. So like if you could go to France and record your stock cues, that would cost you one third as much. Right, right. and okay. part of the problem was because the networks were getting away with using what's called stock music or library music. Right. So anytime a piece of music is recorded, um, it would be recorded with various tempos, endings, um, instrumentation, various measures, not the whole thing. uh, And they would just store it in the library. Mm -hmm. Uh, And what networks would do is pull that library music, which is called canned music. Right. And they would just reuse it wherever they could so they wouldn't have to bother paying for it. Unions were getting upset about this because their members have to eat yeah, so exactly. uh, it just totally came to a head and then they finally came to an agreement that a certain number of episodes per season at that point it was 26 episodes per season at least 13 of them had to be brand new music right right and so that was in 1957 so that was before the twilight zone even started right. filming which was 1959 i right. think that kind of creates an interesting division. So every season, there have to be 13 episodes that had to be made with new music, and the rest of them could be made with canned music or a combination thereof. Right. You're Rod Serling. You just finished filming an episode. Let's say it's To Serve Man, and it's done, and you bring it in. Who made the decision, okay, here we're going to use canned music, and here we're going to set original score? One of our listeners, uh, a guy named Chris Butler, wrote in to say, like, how hands-on was Rod with the episode score? So was he the one making that call, or was it somebody else? No, actually... Actually, for the most part, and I talked to Tommy Morgan and Robert Drasnan, who are absolutely fabulous. They're the only two composers still alive. Oh, oh uh, they're, and, the com- they're two composers who wrote scores for the show. Right. Okay, got um, it. And they both told me that they've never met Rod Serling. Oh, really? Um, the only time Serling got involved with the music is if he didn't like it. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Other uh, than yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So what would happen is they were, uh, there was a music supervisor um, and the music editor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those two positions were held by Eugene Feldman and Lud Gluskin. Right. And what they would do is they would sit down and they would watch what's called a rough cut. Mm-hmm. And the rough cut was essentially a film on this little screen called a moviola. Uh, and they would watch it once and decide, okay, so are we going to use stuff that's in the library or are we going to have to hire somebody to write new music? Right. So once they decided which it would be, um, if it were the former where they would use stock music, mm-hmm. then they would go to the library. Uh, and some of your listeners who were really big music people may actually even have copies of the library cues. Uh, they were released on, I believe, 106 LPs oh, wow. uh, called the <laughs> CBS Easy Q Library. Oh, wow. Uh, and some of them are ridiculous cliches, like, right. you know, the typical Native American music with the tom-toms. Yeah, and like, so this is all CBS, the entire All library. of CBS, okay, exactly. Okay. And each of those 106 LPs had two sides to them. Yeah. So uh, they would go to the EZQ library, which actually had a catalog, and they would see, okay, well, I think this calls for suspenseful music. Right. So I'm going to go to the suspense page and see what we have, mm-hmm. uh, and then go from there. What were some of the reasons that you encountered for, okay, this one we can go with stock cues, and this one we need to do an original score? Sometimes it was completely ra- uh, random. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert Drasnan also worked as music supervisor on about seven, I believe, uh, episodes of Twilight Zone. And he said for him, it was just whatever it seemed like it would fit. Yeah, it's like a feeling or something. Right, Uh, but there were some that were very 
um, contextually tied together, like the invaders and to serve man. Right. Like the, uh, most of the uh, to serve man comes from the invaders and the idea of this, right. you know, the invasion of these aliens coming to your planet and all this other stuff. Um, but most of it was just random. Do you feel like it was, had anything to do with like them feeling that the episode was like particularly good? I mean, I know this maybe is just thinking about it backwards, but like some of the better episodes t- have you know their own score, like the Midnight Sun, which is one of my favorites, mm-hmm. has like a really beautiful, originally written score. It's hard to th- well, you know, there are some bad episodes that have originally written <laughs> yeah. scores. Like I'm thinking from Agnes with Love. Is, yes, is a pretty. Not great episode, and but it has a cool score. Incidentally, <laughs> yeah. out of all of the original Twilight Zone scores, yeah. the manuscripts, that is the only episode that's always missing. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody can find it. Maybe there's you a know, reason for it. <laughs> this, this, is a, this is a bit of a non sequitur, but on From Agnes with Love, there's a weird electronic instrument. And you, you were saying the score is missing for that? Yeah, it's the only Twilight Zone manuscript score that's actually yeah. missing. Unless it's hidden somewhere. Listeners. Um, <laughs> the thing is with that yeah. is that there are... From what I'm understanding, over 1,000 boxes of Twilight Zone material at UCLA, oh, wow. and none of us have been able to actually get through all of those boxes. So huh. um, it could very well be hidden, or it could be hidden somewhere that in with the composer's papers or things like that, or maybe yeah. the composer never donated it. So, so t- talk a little bit about the way. I, this was one really interesting from your thing from your book was that you talk about that the the way that each cue is labeled would sometimes lead to it being used again in certain situations. Like you said, you know, we need suspenseful music, so they looked up suspense, but there were more labels than just that, right? The cues had titles and things like that. Yeah, and the composers more often than not were the ones who actually gave the cues the titles. Right. Sometimes they were just very generic, like bumper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, some were like, um, I, like the box. Yeah. Like, what do you, what could you really, a box can do whatever, yeah, like, really. Yeah. Um, some were very uh, specific. Right. So like, um, you've got that, or something like fear. Like yeah. fear is very specific. You yeah. can use that wherever you want. Um, that in a fearful context or in a suspenseful context. Just interested in like the craziness of that task if you think about it. You know, we're so used to now having digital access so you can listen to something so quickly and mm-hmm. you know, there's a million different ways you can tag something. But like, you know, let's say you have a character saying like, I feel desperate right now and there's a cue called desperation. Of course you're going to listen to that. So mm-hmm. that would like... I feel like I've actually, when I was reading your book and watching The Twilight Zone at the same time, I feel like I caught something like that, like a character says, like, I feel so happy, and the cue is, like, so happy, and I'm like, oh, of course he chose that one, just because... Right. Well, the other thing also is, if it was an original score, a lot of times what the composer would do was name the cue after the line that was being said at that very moment, yeah. so it just made it easier to do it that way. Yeah, exactly, but then I feel like when they went back to reuse some of those cues, mm-hmm. it was like, if the line was indicative of a particular right. emotion, that that would make it easier, because if, if the tree is just called, like, oak tree, that's not very helpful, but right. if the tree is called, I'm scared, Marsha, then you're like, okay, right. someone's scared. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about some of the, the more often used cues. There was one that you sent me via email that I thought was really cool. It was, it was called Bruyard. 1006, Bruyard, take one. You know what this mostly reminds me of is people are alike all over. That's the usage that I can think of in yep. my head is when the Martians are first appearing. Now, tell us tell us a little bit about this cue. You can, it was written by um, Marius Constant. Right, who okay. also wrote the second season. Theme song, the, right. Second, third, fourth fifth season <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that cue has obviously been used in a lot of different places people are like all over is one other place i'm trying to think of other episodes. most unusual camera oh right yeah totally what is that that little it's got like a little bit of vibrato to it or something like that or something what is it's it? actually a violin oh really okay yeah. just going like a yeah he's yeah. playing around with it yeah yeah that's cool and and that was part of just like a library of cues that he wrote right that right was, so okay, yeah my i mean what i was initially saying about the theme was oh, that sorry, we yeah. don't know when his stuff got into the library Okay. Um, so we think it was there at least in 1956, um, mm. but we're not quite sure. So it was sitting around for a while. It sort of had this generic usage. You wrote all these cues. They were recorded and thrown in the library. Yeah, before the point. Twilight Zone even existed. Got right. It. Okay, I mean, yeah. some of the cues, like for Bernard Herrmann's radio plays, like they weren't in there because they were originally done for radio plays. But Herrmann also did isolated suites, he called them, yeah. um, with different cues just for 
because. Um, mm. So we don't quite know why a lot of these, and some of them have really generic names like F story yeah, or right. G, uh, D story, and they're numbered. A musical cue like that to me is just so interesting because it's so specific. It just sounds like the Twilight Zone. You know what I mean? Like right. it doesn't sound like you could use that in a western or a romance or anything. It it, mm-hmm. it has this specific like unease to it. You know? Right. And I, I was that cue. I mean, do you happen to know off the top of your head whether that those that library of cues was used for anything else or was it just? Oh yeah, it was used for a whole bunch. Uh, oh, really? Okay. For gun smoke. Oh really? Wow. Um, yeah. Well, so it could be used for yeah, western. It was, then. Yeah, it, it, and yeah. some of it's, when you listen to some of the context in like say westerns it's just very bizarre to hear yeah, it there yeah yeah it's like this emotional situation that happens over and over again in the twilight zone where a normal person experiences something weird and that kind of music is just so like wow right. that's exactly what the twilight zone yeah. is and Briard yeah. is also used in the whole truth oh, every okay. time um there's a lie being told oh okay and the car is making him tell the truth yeah, that's it's when the cue, yeah 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 it's cool there's another cue that you sent me that's really cool and this one is actually from um uh, a radio drama. Yes. It's, it's Brave New World, which is really often used. It's it's by Bernard Herrmann. Right. Here, let's listen to it. That's in number 12, Looks Just Like You, I want to say. Yeah. Charles Beaumont mm-hmm. wrote a short story called The Beautiful People that right. appeared in uh, Worlds of Is- If Science Fiction, uh, which is actually available online. You can go read the short story. It's actually really much more creepy than... Oh, really? Than um, the, the final episode? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. much it's much more graphic. Oh, really? Um, they actually talk about the changes that Marilyn will have done, like take a piece of skin off here and a bone here. Oh, okay, got um, it. Actually, interestingly enough, Val in that is mm-hmm. her boyfriend. Oh, really? And not her best friend. Uh, so then John Tomerlin wrote two versions of the teleplay uh, from Beaumont's story. And then when they did it, because it was so similar to number to um, Brave New World, they actually took the radio play score oh, okay. and put it into number 12 looks just like you. Oh, this is just like this other thing. We have this lying around. So right. it's cool. Yeah. And there's just so many clothes, like for instance, Brave New World, but taking Soma to make you happy. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. in... What's happy Twilight soda or... Uh, in Glass of Instant Smile. Instant Smile. Yeah, I love that bit. From you know, they the... even had the same... They even mentioned in Brave New World about Shakespeare being banned. Oh, right. And they mentioned that in the Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. So it's just so many things are so close that they just figured, you know, this works really well. And I mean, there's just something about like Brave New World, even without any music attached to it, just the emotional palette mm-hmm. of it and the exactly. way it is very Twilight Zone. And it was also used in The Obsolete Man. Oh, right. And in the scene where he, Burgess Meredith is reading the Bible and sort of Fritz Weaver is sweating because he knows he's going to die. Yeah. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from the bloody men. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgressions, not for my sins, O oh God. Yeah, yeah, it's like exactly the same kind. Yeah, right. it's like, oh, the dystopian future? Got exactly. It. We got, we got yep. some for this. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about the theme. Um, you know, there's obviously the iconic theme, but for the first season of the show, there was a totally different theme, right. which was written by Bernard Herrmann, right? right? So was that written like to order or was that from a library queue? No, that was written to order. Okay, got it. Um, And then somewhere in the middle of the first season, they decided, they being Blood Gluskin and Eugene Feldman and Mm -hmm. uh, the powers that be at CBS decided, eh, this is kind of not really doing it for us. Yeah, it's very atmospheric and and kind of vibey. I mean, I really like it. I think it's great. In your book, you mentioned that it's, possibly a reference to this thing called the planets by gustav holtz yeah or, okay cool was that like uh, verbalized by herman or is no. it just it sounds so it similar? sounds very similar to okay, it okay cool There's various stories as to what happened at that mm-hmm. point. Um, Marius Constant swears that, yeah. and he sa- swears this in an interview, yeah. that he uh, was told about this contest for a quote-unquote new 
science fiction series. Right, even which, though it's been out for a year. Right. Yeah. Um, and that he should submit it, and the prize would be $300. Uh-huh. Um, and so he wrote this theme furiously, and he sent it in, and then he didn't find out until a few months later, when after it started to be used, from some American tourists in Paris that, oh, so you wrote that music? Right. Um, and he's French, and he was living in... Paris. Got it yeah. at the time. Got it. Okay. Um, and we, we were try- I was trying to figure out where he was at the time, mm-hmm. um, because he had an American premiere of one of his pieces that has a lot of thematic stuff that sound a lot like the Twilight Zone theme. So huh. I was sort of wondering, you know, what was going on with that. Right. Um, according to Lud Gluskin, he said that there were two uh, library cues, Etranger and... Uh, that were already in the library and he just figured he would splice them together and use it that way yeah uh, marius constant's son has been extremely helpful um Except that he has, doesn't have his papers anymore. Oh, okay. Uh, he donated his papers. There's only one thing about the Twilight Zone theme in the papers, and that's a letter f- to a lawyer because he was wondering if some commercial was using his music. Right, okay. Um, so we, there's no way of really knowing so much. I mean, well, it just seems obvious if the two cues exist separately, then it had to have been Lud Gluskin who put them together because how could Marius Constant have written a new piece that was just... So obviously, composed of two pieces that he'd already written. Well, <laughs> um, so sorry, I don't want to put you on. No, the spot no, here. no. <laughs> uh, the only reason I'm saying "well" that way is yeah. because um, currently I'm working on the Outer Limits, uh-huh. uh, and Dominic Frontieri said I wrote the theme for the, the Outer Limits in 15 minutes at my desk, and then if you go back to Stony Burke, which is the series he did before that, yeah, one of the episodes has cues that essentially became the Outer Limits theme. Right. So, <laughs> so it's possible that like he unconsciously combined things he'd written in the past. Exactly. Everybody does that yeah, on some yeah. level. Yeah. It's so interesting. Like I really love the first season theme because it's so like it sort of like draws you into this world in a really compelling way. But there's also just something so perfect about this two, three, four, five because it's like it's like a perfect encapsulation of the show itself it's got this little uneasy thing and then there's like a twist like I think you mentioned that in the right. book is that that little the little flourish is like almost like a musical twist right. so it's a really perfect uh, idea and then so Lud Gloss can cut it together out of two cues supposedly let's just run right. with that for now and then you were saying in your book that Bernard Herrmann actually reorchestrated it almost like well I can do this better is that is that what happened I mean there was one thing if you listen to the theme in Little Girl Lost yeah it's actually very different from the theme in any of the other episodes. Uh, Bernard Herman was in Paris at the time. Mm-hmm. For some reason, I don't really know why, um, he felt compelled to also re-record Constance opening and titles. Okay, got So it. they sound slightly different. Huh, okay. Um, so to rewind back to originally when they're making the decision, okay, we have this episode, we want to either make it a stock cue episode or we're going to make it a totally new score. Let's say instead of deciding on stock cues, they decide, okay, we're going to do new score. And they decide on a composer and they bring the composer in. They had something called a spotting session. Right. You want to explain a little bit what that, what that was about? So first they would decide which composer they wanted to write the music. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it was a financial decision. Mm -hmm. Uh, One composer might have worked cheaper than the others. Uh, Some of them also had a very specific style. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Fred Steiner, one of the things he had mentioned in one of his interviews was that he was known for writing uh, radio show comedies. Right. And he he did The Bard, so... Right. right, Which is basically a radio show comedy. Exactly. Yeah. And he begged Lud Gluskin to let him do A Twilight Zone. So they said, okay, we'll we'll let you do 100 yards over the rim. Uh, So... Gluskin and Feldman and Steiner would sit in in this little room uh, and they would watch the episode and they would make what's called timing notes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so what that would be is like they would write the lines with the time stamp uh, and then they would make notes. Okay, like um, funny music here, 30 seconds or something like that. Uh, And then Steiner would go back and he would write music for it. Uh, At that recording session, 
uh, Gluskin actually buzzed into the recording studio and said, I had no idea you could write music like that. <laughs> because he was so used to hearing him like, you know, like with boring. comedies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but that's what the composer would do. Nowadays, yeah. it's easier um, yeah. because they have DVDs and they could send it home with the composer. Yeah. Uh, but back then, they had maybe one time to watch it. That's so incredible to think about that. Like the yeah. level of, you know not only musicianship but like memory of like okay here like if the only note you have is 15 seconds and make it funny like it right, just exactly. seems insane that that they could do something like that um and 100 yards of them is a great score i mean it actually kind of has a vaguely comedic not exactly but those like harp glisses yeah. or those like that, that has kind of a like a punchline stinger type right. of thing yeah So talk about some of the other composers. I mean, obviously, Fred Steiner, we've mentioned. Bernard Herrmann uh, is a very famous film composer. Jerry Goldsmith, too, yes. is, a, is, a, is a big one. He, I mean, I knew him as, as a kid because he was one of the people who wrote the Star Trek The Next Generation theme. Exactly. Yeah. So were these, uh, were those people, were Jerry Goldsmith and Bernard Herrmann at the time, like, the big guns, or were they not as well known as they are now? I mean... Uh, well, Bernard Herrmann was because he had scored a lot of film music. Right. Oh, yeah. He did Citizen Kane like years right. before the project. Uh, Jerry right. Goldsmith actually got started as a copyist. Oh, okay. Um, and not <laughs> even not <laughs> even a music copyist. Like he was working at something like the accounting department or something oh, really? okay. like that. Right. Um, and he sort of worked his way and weaseled his way into the music department. Um, so he was at that point just up and coming. Right. Okay. Got it. Uh, and so Herman was basically the big gun, basically, yeah. if they, like, really wanted, like, a... Because yeah, one thing I noticed in um, for Little Girl Lost in particular, Martin Krams in his book talks about how uh, Richard Matheson was maybe not that happy with the treatment some of his episodes were getting via the directors. Sterling was like, we're going to do you right this time, you know, Dick. Like, we're going to get right. this episode done great. And uh, Graham surmises that that's maybe why Herman was called in to do a score specifically. Yeah, yeah. So, exactly. So it's like, we're going to give you Bernard Herman. Right. Yeah. The other big gun was Franz Waxman. Oh, really? Okay. Who only did one episode, which was a 16 millimeter shine. Really? Okay. And that was a very special case because if you've ever seen Sunset Boulevard, it's right. really a short remake of Sunset Boulevard. Sure, of course. Yeah. Um, even right down to the final scene where they're both descending the stairs and this sort of madness happening. Oh, so did Franz Waxman do the score for Sunset he, Boulevard? For both, yeah. Oh, really? That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And even Leonid Rab, um, who orchestrated Sunset Boulevard, also orchestrated. Wow. And the funny thing about that is it's even really um, composed in a very similar way, very similar kinds of instruments. One of the things that I've been looking at lately is why Boxman composed a 16 millimeter shrine the way he did. Mm -hmm. And part of it, I believe, is from the issues of speakers. Oh, really? So okay. you could hear uh, many more nuances in a movie theater, even in 1950, than you could on a teeny weeny television right. set yeah, in yeah, 1959. Yeah. So they'd have uh, the spotting session, the composer would go home and write the music, and then they'd bring it in for a recording session. And uh, another interesting thing from your book I noticed was that, um, I guess just because of budget uh, issues, most of the orchestras or groups were pretty small. They were, like it, it was usually like 10 people or even less than that. Right. Was that atypical or was that normal for a TV show of that era? Um, it was relatively normal. Okay, um, cool. There were some that were abnormally large, like uh, yeah. the Invaders. Right. And that was because Jerry Goldsmith specifically said, I need like a ridiculous number of strings to accomplish this because there's absolutely no dialogue and I need to do something to compensate for that. Right, yeah. And um, in your book, you have an appendix that lists like all the recording sessions and who played what, which I, you know, I, as, I mean, I have many, many books about like what the Beatles did every day in the studio. So I really <laughs> enjoyed that. And also like mic diagrams, I thought that was yeah. so cool. Um, you know, 
I was really tempted to go through and just see if I could like recognize any names in there. I mean, did you did you, did you find anyone in the list of like the call sheets for musicians, like famous studio musicians or anything like that? I'm sure there must be some people in there of note, you know. Well, the, yeah, I mean, there's also a bit of a complicated thing with studio musicians is that mm-hmm. sort of like you know once you get in, you never get out kind of thing. Yeah, that's um, true. so. A lot of these players played on practically every TV series ever right. um, because they were just really wanted. In fact, just looking at Twilight Zone versus Outer Limits, um, a lot of the musicians were the same. There are interesting sounds in the Twilight Zone. I mean, a lot of the episodes have more relatively straight orchestration, but some of them use weird instruments and go for weird effects. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the more interesting examples that you can think of in your head. Yeah, so like, for instance, Nathan Van Cleef did a lot of that. Okay, um, he was he, uh, one, of the, one of the composers. Right, he yeah. wrote Midnight Sun, he wrote right, two. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a, a spot in the Midnight Sun in the score he talks about um, turning on the motor on your vibraphone versus... Mm, um, or uh, adding reverb or specific notes to specific players, like, I want you to play it like this. Yeah. Um, so he was a big fan of the electronic stuff, especially. Right. Yeah. We've been talking a lot about The Invaders. I feel like we should listen to a few clips. Let, let's talk about, it's written by Jerry Goldsmith. The episode, in case you haven't seen it, well, first of all, you shouldn't be listening to this podcast, but if you haven't seen The Invaders, uh, it's a it's basically mostly silent. There's almost no dialogue, and it's about an old woman who's terrorized by these small little space creatures. Yeah, so he had actually stated at one point that he knew because there was no dialogue, the music had to carry everything. Yeah. Um, and of course, they couldn't put any dialogue because the second Agnes Moorhead would have opened her mouth, it would have given everything away. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what he tried to do is he tried to compose atmospheric music, um, but also music that would uh, be evocative of emotions and situations and, and things like that. Um, so you have stuff like the knife and things like that. <laughs> That almost sounds like um, Psycho. Psycho, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was. I remember when we did our episode on the Invaders. I was. I made the stupid comparison, saying, "Oh, Bernard Herrmann did both," but of course he did. And Jerry Goldsmith, uh, Bernard Herrmann did Psycho, I think, right? Yeah. And but he didn't do that. This right. obviously, but it has that exact same stabbing sound. Yeah. It's very cool. One thing I noticed from your uh, book about that is you mentioned that he sort of comp- like a lot of the score covers when she's not being frightened, but when she's being frightened, it's silent, which almost yeah. like exaggerates the emotions, like the weird inverse like polar opposite because we would expect to hear some sort of music when yeah. at these dramatic moments he actually dramatizes it by taking the music away yeah it's very cool it's a great score um when was psycho made now i'm just trying to think in my head was it made in the 60s or yeah it was in the 60s okay so i'm just gonna get it on record that bernard herman definitely ripped off Jerry goldsmith <laughs> for that definitively said here and now and then um, that music was reused for, or not that music cue. Oh, that cue actually specifically was reused in To Serve Man, yes. wasn't it? So why do you th- tell me a little bit about why they reused so many cues from the invaders for To Serve Man. What, what, why, what were they going for there? I think in this case it was context okay. um, because they're both concerning, quote unquote, aliens yeah. um, coming to some other society. And the invaders, it's trying to explore in To Serve Man. It's... It's a good book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and part of the other issue with this is some people may have noticed mm-hmm. the score being reused. Mm-hmm. I can't say how many people did. Yeah. Um, but for those that did, they might draw a parallel between, oh, so this is the one from the invaders. So, I mean, we're not really sure. I'm not really sure how many people noticed things like that. Back yeah. Then, especially on one viewing. Yeah, well, I mean, it's hard because, you know, now, obviously, you watch the episode 50 times on DVD. But, exactly. Like, it's something, it's a comparison that might be a little far-fetched for the average viewer of the show, but because the people who are working on it were so aware of these things, right. it's not so crazy. Um, and then another episode that you wanted to talk about, which is really cool, I actually just watched it today because I haven't seen it in a long time, is, um, <laughs> don't tell my boss, but I watched it at work, uh, <laughs> is uh, Miniature, a fourth season episode. And this one was, who was the composer? It was Fred Steiner, right? Yes. So tell us a little bit about um, you know why the music is interesting. So for Ed Steiner actually writes two different kinds of music. Mm-hmm. Um, one 
is uh, char- what I call Charlie's theme, and actually he called Charlie's theme, uh, which was uh, music from a Mozart sonata. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's actually introduced when uh, Robert Duvall goes up to the dollhouse and sees the doll playing. Right. Um, and that's what he hears her playing on the spinet. Right. Um, and so it actually becomes a theme for him. So is, is it a is it reworked version of a Mozart no. sonata or is it just basically the sonata? It's basically okay. the same. Okay, got um, it. And in fact, Robert Duvall actually winds up um, whistling it at one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the way Steiner plays around with it, he actually plays around with the ending in that instead of it actually ending uh, where it should end mm-hmm. musically, he makes it end on a note other than that to sort of show some sort of inclus- inconclusivity. So it, it basically, he takes a piece of music that like has a very specific ending and then ends it in a different place, which creates right. a guy. Okay. And it's not until the toward the very end that he actually ends, well, except for here. Yeah. Um, but he ends where it should end. Okay, so at the very end, when it's like a happy ending of the when show, he's or, yeah, when he's in the dollhouse, exactly, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and the, you know, the music for that episode is also really interesting too, because I feel like when he's looking at the dollhouse world, it's very like lively. And has a certain character to it, but when he's out in the regular world, there's not that much music, and when it is, it's very like lone notes or something. Right, like exactly. That. Yeah. And the only other really intense musical sections are uh, in the dollhouse when um, the doll is being quote unquote attacked by her suitor. Right, exactly. And Fred Steiner said that he saw when he saw that in the spotting session, mm-hmm. he thought about it as being uh, like silent movie music. Right. And so he composed it in two ways. Number one, like a silent movie would be composed, but also with really high instruments because there's teeny tiny little dolls. Oh, of yeah. course, they have to have <laughs> teeny tiny little instruments. Yeah. So that's um, how he did that. Yeah. Did, did he also do the music for Once Upon a Time or was that somebody no. else? But um, he also did um, the, well, he did the Bard, obviously, oh, Steiner. Yeah, um, yeah. But what he did with there is he actually went and looked in. Um, the Fitzwilliam Virginal book, which was the uh, the quintessential keyboard music book uh-huh. from 16th century and 15th century England, oh, okay. uh, and he pulled pieces from there to represent Shakespeare. And he actually cut some of those out. Oh, okay. I have his list. He left a list of all the ones he was going to use. And oh, he cut cool. like, several of them out. For those like harpsichord bits? Exactly. Yeah, that's cool. You know, it's funny. I'll, I don't like the bard, but I think <laughs> the music in it is actually kind of awesome. Yeah. There's a really cool bit that now un- understanding how they, uh, you know, made these scores, it seems impossible to me to do it, but there's a part where... Um, Julius Moomer. Julius Moomer, right. With a ridiculous <laughs> a name, name. for the ages. Yeah, right. Uh, when he's sort of like announcing like a show by Julius Moomer and like there's a musical cue that goes underneath it that like matches up with him going like rum pum 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 because he's imitating a marching band. The Shannon Food Corporation presents <laughs> The Tragic Cycle written by Julius Moomer. <laughs> From an original story by Julius Moomer, with additional dialogue by Julius Moomer. (laughs) 
Right, exactly. And Fred Steiner must have written a cue to that. And it matches up really well. Like, yeah. how could you do that in one spotting session? Yeah, it I guess you just have to be. Me. Yeah. I mean, like, now you could do it relatively easily because you're sitting at a computer. But, like, right. if you think about how well that syncs up, it's it's really impressive. Um, again, not my favorite episode, well. but, <laughs> but, but the music is awesome. Um, okay, cool. So, we're kind of, I got a few listener questions I just wanted to ask you. Yeah. Nothing, nothing too crazy, but. Um, Harold, Harold Clark writes in to say, uh, The Twilight Zone came out at a time when television was a relatively new medium. They were still figuring out what you could do and couldn't do on TV, uh, as well as you could and couldn't say, but that's another story. Was it the same for music written on TV? Were they still figuring out what worked best for this new medium? Did they pull styles from radio dramas and theater, or, or did they just look to movie soundtracks and adapt from that? We've covered that a little bit, but talk yeah, about it. Yeah, it's a little of both. Um, yeah. And some of the, because radio was, quote unquote, the theater of the mind, yeah. uh, where you didn't have the luxury of seeing what was going on, just hearing it, uh, there was a way, that, there was a problem where they had to negotiate what. Um, they were going to do to sort of compensate for that. Are we going to literally depict what's going on on the screen, uh, which we call Mickey Mousing, uh, because it actually originally used in Mickey Mouse cartoons, Um, or are we going to do something that's more um, in-depth, that leaves uh, the viewer not actually hearing the music per se, um, Mm -hmm. but noticing if it weren't there is another thing, uh, which came from film. Right, right. So it's kind of like combinations of both. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and then uh, a listener named Jay Spence wanted to know um, just where the best place to get a lot of the unedited cues was. I mean, can you, are they all in the, I guess they wouldn't all be in the library because some of them are independent of the library, right? Right. Um, there's the EZQ library, um, yeah. but there's also um, the, well, depending on what you're doing. Um, mm-hmm. So, for instance, if you're looking for something like The Hitchhiker, mm-hmm. um, which, incidentally, the actual radio play The Hitchhiker, right. the yeah, same yeah. music, and the uh, teleplay was written. The radio play was written by Bernard Herman's then wife, right. Lucille yeah, Fletcher, that was so who crazy. Yeah. sort of really hated the fact they turned. Oh yeah, from a man to a woman, woman yeah. and various other things. Yeah. Um, Bernard Herman CDs have um, those cues, or they have suites, mm-hmm. um, which combine the cues together. Uh, Brave New World is another one. Um, the Outer Space Suite, which is one of those that went yeah. into the library that was actually never written for anything. Um, and then there's a the 40th anniversary collection which i believe is four cds right um and there's a lot of that and then joel mcneely's recording as well is that um, like a re-recording of it's a re-recording okay, yeah cool. well we're going to put some of this up on the tumblr so jay sit tight and we're, we'll get links for all that stuff i don't know i think that's pretty much it um i guess the main thing is just to tell people how they can get the book um once again it's called the dimension of sound it's by reba wisner my guest today how can people get it reba uh, amazon has it uh also barnes and noble and my publisher's website, pendragonpress.com, also has it. I would highly recommend everyone get it. Uh, it's really fun. It's very in-depth. It's kind of like the Martin Graham's book, but just for the music side of The Twilight Zone. And uh, if people want to get in touch with you, do you have like a Twitter page or Facebook where people can follow you just as a... Yeah, they'll have a Facebook page. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. Just Reba Wisner? Yeah. Okay. Look the only up. one. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for being a guest. I really Thanks appreciate for it. Me. It was really fun to talk. I feel like we've been talking another hour, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, again, Fred here with a little uh, post-show Easter egg. I hope you guys liked the interview. Um, When we were preparing for it, Reba actually sent me a lot of cues to listen to, and some of them uh, are actually originally production cues, so you can hear... At the beginning, Lud Gluskin, the music supervisor, sort of announcing the title of the cue and letting people know what take it was, and then the music 
the musicians start playing. So it's, it's taken from the original recording session. Uh, I just thought they were really cool. Uh, we didn't get to listen to all of them in the course of the interview, but I wanted just uh, to share this one. It's uh, the cue Light Rain, which I'm sure you'll recognize when I play it. So just one final little thing. Once again, thanks for listening. Have a good night. 1005, Light Rain, take one. <laughs> 